the file allocation table. What is the file allocation table? The file allocation table is a file system developed by Microsoft. It consists of a series of clusters that hold data and a table that determines the state of a cluster. The boot sector, otherwise known as the bootloader, stores information about the file system. The FAT16 file system uses clusters to represent data and subdirectories. Each cluster uses a fixed amount of sectors, which is specified in the boot sector. Every file in FAT16 needs to use at least one cluster for its data. This means a lot of storage is wasted for small files. For example, we could have a file called hello.txt that just contains hello world. It is still going to use at least one cluster, which is a lot of wasted data. FAT16 is not the most efficient file system. It's very easy to implement, however. So FAT16 cannot store files larger than two gigabyte without large file support. With large file support, four gigabyte is the maximum. So this is the FAT16 file system disk layout on the disk. So the first sector here, we have the boot sector. We've written a boot sector before. A boot sector or boot loader is 512 bytes in size. Even though this is a file system, we can still boot from the medium because the boot sector that the file allocation table uh, file system requires is formatted in such a way it allows us to still store code in the boot sector. I'll show you this later on. So we would still be using our boot sector to load our kernel. However, just bear in mind when we implement the file allocation table, the boot sector will also contain certain meta information about the file system. Okay, which you'll see soon. So after the boot sector in the file allocation table, we have the reserved sectors. Now, this is essentially sectors we don't want to be included as part of the file system. So for example, in the boot sector, we have a little field that specifies how many reserved sectors we have, right? And the number in this field also includes the boot sector itself. So if you don't have any reserved sectors, then the reserved sector field should contain one because the boot sector still counts as a reserved sector, if that makes sense. Now the size of the reserved sectors is the reserved sectors field in the file allocation header, which is stored in the boot sector, by the way, multiplied by 512 because 512 is the sector size on uh, hard disks. After the reserved sectors, we have the FAT1. Now FAT stands for file allocation table. Essentially, the FAT stores information that explains which part of the disk is free and which part of the disk is used, which part of the disk is inaccessible. That's what the file allocation table describes. And it also allows you to chain clusters together. Okay, so for example, if you have a file that's two clusters in size, then um, in the file allocation table, you'll have two bytes that represent a cluster okay and the value of those two bytes will be the number of the next cluster of that file but we'll get more on that later and here we have the fat 2 now this is optional so i'm not going to discuss this in this presentation however it's essentially just a duplicate of the fat 1 and it's to be used as a backup uh, for things like data corruption and it's completely optional now after the second file allocation table or the first file allocation table if you don't have a second, we have the root directory. Now, the size of the root directory is specified in a field in the file allocation header, file allocation table header, I should say, and the field is the root directory entries. So the size of the root directory is simple. It's the root directory entries multiplied by the size of the fat directory item structure, okay? And we also need to round this up to the sector as well, by the way. So the root directory will always use at least uh, one sector. It isn't going to use uh, 30 bytes, do you understand? So uh, we need to round that to 512, okay? So uh, essentially, if size of the root directory does not fit into a sector, then we need to um, add one sector to the size. Okay, now after the root directory, we have our data clusters. Here is where all our data is stored. Our hello.txt text file, the hello will be wrote. That is stored in these data clusters. Um, remember, each file uses at least one data cluster, okay? 
uh, subdirectories are also stored in the data clusters as well. So that's the entire structure of FAT16. I'm now going to break down each part and we'll go into more detail and I'll give you some examples. Okay, so this is the FAT16 boot sector format I was telling you about. So the very first thing you see is a short jump. This is assembly as you can see. Now this is a short jump to the start label. This ensures that we jump over the FAT16 header and all of that stuff. And we also require no operation after our short jump. I mean, this is how the format expects it, okay? File allocation table expects it in this format. So next comes all the header information. And in the header information, you can see we, we store the bytes per sector. This field should be ignored, by the way, because uh, we can't rely that it's correct. Sectors per cluster, this is a good field. We need to rely on this. This is how many sectors there are in one cluster, okay? Because remember, I was telling you the clusters where the file information is stored, right? Then we have our reserved sectors. So you can see in this implementation, we have 200 reserved sectors. And uh, obviously, if you have quite a big kernel, you're going to need quite a lot of reserved sectors there, unless you plan to load the kernel from disk, which we won't do, by the way, because it's more complicated. And we can see here we specify the amount of fact copies. Remember, I said you can have one file allocation table or a second one, which is a backup. So that's why this says two. So this media type can be ignored. The number of sectors here can be ignored and all that sort of stuff. Sectors per fat is important. This is how many sectors are in the file allocation table itself. So file allocation table one, fat one, fat two, you know. Again, sectors per track, number of heads. These can all be ignored. We don't have to worry about these. Here are OEM identifier. This is a little important, but not too important. You know when you put in a USB stick in your computer and it tells you uh, the volume name, stuff like that, what it's actually called? Well, the OEM identifier can be used for that basically, right? Okay, so that's what the boot sector looks like. Uh, after the file system header, uh, we can see our start label. You can't see it because it's further down, but we jump to that and then that can all just be code. Okay, just as long as the head is formatted this way, everything will be fine. You need a short jump and you need an operation. And this is the assembled version. So this is what it looks like when you open the file system in a hex editor. So yeah, we can see that sector there and we can see we still have our little boot signature at the bottom here, 55AA. Okay, so that signifies we are bootable. Now you can see after the first sector, these are all our reserved sectors. So because we specify reserved sectors 200, this means we have 200 reserved sectors after the boot sector before we have our file allocation table. 200 times 512 is 102,400 bytes. If our kernel exceeds this size, we need to increase the reserved sectors to 201 or otherwise we risk corrupting the file allocation table or the file allocation table will corrupt us. So after the reserved sectors, we have our file allocation table, the first file allocation table, file allocation table one, FAT1. And we can see it looks like this. So we can see the first few entries here ignored. And then we have FF, 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 FF. Now each entry is two bytes in size, okay? So if we count here, zero, one, two, three. So where it says FFFF, the very first FFFF, this is talking about cluster three. And cluster three is taken. And we know it's taken because the value is FFFF. FFFF means end of file. So this basically means that whatever data this is, there's no more data after it. So in our hello.txt example, hello world, that's only going to be one cluster in size. So we see FFFF. So this signifies this is the last cluster for this file. If the hello.txt file was two clusters in size, then there will be a number here pointing to the next cluster. So let's say it was cluster four where the file continued. Then number four would be here and it would point to this one and this one would be FFFF. Okay, so as you know, each entry in the file allocation table is two bytes long. I just explained that to you. But what you might not know is they represent a cluster in the data clusters region that is available or taken, okay? So another thing, clusters can chain together. For example, a file larger than one cluster will use two clusters. The value that represents the first cluster in the file allocation table will contain the value of the next cluster. The final cluster will contain a value of 0x, ff, ff, 
signifying that there are no more clusters. The size of a cluster is represented in the boot sector. Let's take a look at this example table, and let's assume that we are starting from cluster 0. We can see here, cluster 0 contains decimal 3 which means that there's more clusters to come and we should look at index 3. So 0, 1, 2, 3. This is index 3 and we can see it says ZUX FFFF signifying the end of the cluster chain. So whatever this cluster here is representing has two clusters. It could be representing a subdirectory or it could be representing a file, file data. Now as I've already said, cluster 0 is not really used. We usually start a cluster 3 but I wanted to give this example from zero because it's easier for you to understand. So we can see our file allocation table points to our data clusters as demonstrated in these tables. So this represents data cluster zero, this represents data cluster one, this represents data cluster two, data cluster three, and so on. So obviously finding out where the data is in the data clusters is quite simple. We need to first know the position of where our data clusters start and we know this because it's directly after the root directory. Okay so now that we know that what happens next? Well we just multiply the cluster index by the size of a cluster and the size of a cluster is specified in the boot sector. So for example uh, this specifies cluster 0. So this cluster here represents the very first cluster after the root directory. So this represents the very first cluster in the data clusters region. So it'll literally be the first byte after the root directory. And obviously this is one, so you multiply one by the size of the cluster, let's say 65,536 or something, right? So then you know that uh, when you multiply that by one, you'll get 65,536, and that would be the first byte of the next cluster. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. These are just numbers I'm throwing at you here, just as an example. We probably won't use these exact numbers, just to let you know. I'm just trying to simplify it for you. This is the process that's going on under the hood, and this is what we're going to be expected to write in the C programming language. So let's explain the FAT16 root directory. File systems have directories, otherwise known as folders. FAT16 is no different. FAT16 has what's known as a root directory. This is the topmost directory in the system. Think of your C drive. At the very top level of your C drive, this is the root directory. Directories contain directory entries of a fixed size. So this is what a directory entry looks like. So we can see we have the file name, which is eight bytes long. Very short file name, isn't it? There is long file names, they do exist, but we're gonna ignore it because it's more complicated to implement and I wanna keep this simple for you. We can see we have an extension of three bytes for that file name. We have an attribute field. This contains things like flags and so on. Reserved is self-explanatory. We shouldn't use it. It's reserved. This is the creation time, creation date, the last time it was accessed, uh, the high 16 bits of the first cluster for the data region of this directory item, and the low 16 bits of the first cluster. So simply put, if this directory item represents a file, then um, oring these two together, the high, high bits and low bits, will give you the cluster of where the first byte is for this file. So hello.txt has hello world, right? The high 16 bits, the first cluster, and the low 16 bits, the first cluster, point to where that hello world message is stored, okay? The attribute field also contain flags that determine if this directory item is a file, a directory, or if it's read-only and so on. So directory items can either be subdirectories or files, okay? If it's a file, then the, the first cluster points to where the start of the file data is. If it's a directory, then the first cluster points to the cluster where the subdirectory directory items are stored. And obviously, they're stored the same way as they are stored on the root directory. Because on the root directory, you basically have an array of these directory entries, right? Subdirectories are exactly the same. We have a bunch of files and subdirectories represented by fat directory items. Okay, I explain this here as well on this text. Okay, so how do we iterate through directories? Well, the boot sector contains the maximum number of root directory entries, and we should not exceed this value when iterating through the root directory. We know when we have finished iterating through the root directory or a subdirectory because the first byte of the file name will be equal to zero. So what I mean by that is, you know how we have an array of these directory items in the root directory and in the subdirectory. There'll be an empty item somewhere 
at the very bottom of that uh, directory and the first byte in the file name will be zero okay so that's how we know when we're done because there's always a blank entry at the bottom of the directory or subdirectory so we just check for zero so the directory entry attribute flags you know these directory entries they're representing either a file or a directory okay so these flags we have read only and this is a bit mask okay read only file hidden system file do not move volume label 0x10 means that this is not a regular file it's a subdirectory so if this bit is set then it's a subdirectory if it's not set then it represents a regular file bit 0x20 archived bit 0x40 device bit 0x80 reserved must not be changed by disk tools so these are the flags in the attribute field in the directory entries okay so we now need to talk a little about the file name and the extension because there's special rules that might catch you out uh the file name is eight bytes wide unused bytes are padded with spaces not null terminators i know it's weird this is how it's done okay so you know the file name's done when there's a space and this also explains why spaces are illegal in this file system they get replaced with some weird other character but more on that later the extension is exactly the same it's three bytes wide and unused bytes are padded with spaces so you know when you're done because you see a space each cluster represents a certain amount of sectors linearly to each other so this is important to know for example in the boot sector we might have uh, 80 sectors per cluster so this means that one cluster is 80 sectors long okay easy the data clusters section in the file system contains all the clusters that make up the subdirectories and file data of files throughout the FAT file system. So some useful tips before we end this lecture. Always use attribute packed on structures in the C programming language that are to be stored or read from disks. The C compiler can do very clever optimizations to speed up your code. It can change these the way these structures are stored in memory and this could be very bad for us because we need it read and written exactly as we created the structure. So by doing attribute pack, that ensures that always happens. I want you to pay very close attention to the upcoming videos. Things are going to get very difficult and mistakes might happen. Be prepared to use a debugger, such as JDB and attach debugging symbols as I've shown you in previous lectures. You might need to debug this if you run into issues. But don't sweat it, I've broken the FAT file system down, I've explained it to you. So now you should have a rough idea what's going on when we start writing the code. Now I have written the file allocation table implementation before. It's around 750 lines of code um, for a file allocation table that can only read, not write. And you know, so this is what you're gonna be expected to write, around 750 lines. So just prepare yourself for it. Pay close attention to everything I'm saying because you have a lot to learn.